Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Taylor, Chief Executive of the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you for this evening's special event in our nice, cool, uh, great room. Thank you for joining us when I'm sure the temptations are sitting outside a pub and having a glass of wine were there, but it'll still be nice and warm uh, at the end of our event. Um, and in fact, we are even going to offer you a glass of wine when we've completed our conversations. Before we begin, can I ask you to make sure your mobile phone is switched to silent? We're filming tonight and live streaming over the web, so welcome to anyone who's watching online. I think we've, we've been told we've got an international audience joining us this evening from as far away as Australia, where I think it's the middle of the night. Uh, so that's dedication for you. So hello to Australia. Uh, our hashtag tonight is RSA Graph, if you'd like to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Um, now, as that hashtag suggests, this evening we're delighted to welcome as our keynote speaker, Philip Graff. Tonight we're marking the end of Philip's tenure as chair of the Gambling Commission after five years of service. Uh, in a way, I'm partially responsible for this occasion as I recently wrote a fairly critical blog post about the way that I saw gambling evolving, heartfelt to an extent because I am an occasional gambler myself, and I laid down a challenge to the industry, which Philip, to his credit, took seriously. He came to see me and wanted to talk to me about the issues, and out of that conversation I said, well, sometimes when people are finishing their period of office, Chris Smith did it at the Environment Agency and Justin Forsyth did it at Save the Children, people come and give a speech at the end reflecting on what they've learned and offering some thoughts for the future when they've moved on. So uh, Philip took that invitation, which is uh, great, and that's why he's here this evening. Philip, as many of you will know, was formerly chief executive and then chair of the Trinity Mirror Group, has held many senior roles throughout his career, serving as an advisor to government and as a board member of a number of charities. Tonight, as I've suggested, he'll reflect on his time at the Gambling Commission and the challenges he sees ahead for the industry and for the politicians and regulators seeking to protect the citizen and consumer. After Philip's opening remarks, uh, I'll, have a few I'll have a few questions for him in follow-up, and then it's over to you. I know we've got a very engaged audience. I've looked at where you've come from. There's many people from the industry, and there's some people who are very critical of the industry. So we're going to have a lively debate, but I'm sure you will observe the RSA's tradition of uh, having a lively debate, but treating people with uh, courtesy and making sure that we have generate more light than Heat. We don't need any more heat tonight, I don't think. Uh, so we're looking forward to your perspectives and hearing your questions and comments. So without further ado, let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Philip Raff. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you, Matthew. Thank you to the RSA for the opportunity. And uh, thank you, Mayor, also to Regulus and Harris Hagen who actually, I think, providing a number of very important things this evening, not least of which are the drinks afterwards. So particular thanks to you about that. Um, <clears throat> if you take the um, N71 out of Cork towards Bantry, you go through the beautiful countryside of West Cork. Um, it's um, agricultural country, it's um, dairy cattle, and above all, it's horse country. Lots of horses, right? and lots of people who care passionately about horses. About 35 minutes out of um, Cork, you'll come to Clonakilty. Clonakilty is at the, at the head of the Bay of Clonakilty. And they, um, last May 31st, they had their annual point to point. The annual point to point, six races, six horses each race, um, 12 fences over three miles. And it was a family day out. Great fun. Mothers, fathers, uh, children. All of them interested, obviously, in the day. Many of them very knowledgeable about horses. And what became very clear, as you discovered there were six bookmakers there trying to earn a crust in an afternoon, a number of them very knowledgeable about betting, um, including some nine and ten-year-olds who were giving a great deal of advice uh, to their father and mother as to where to place uh, their bets. Um, I mean, that's a somewhat idyllic. And by the way, the weather was a bit like today. So it was a beautiful day. And so it was fun, family day out, um, quote unquote harmless betting, um, a million miles away from the world of gambling regulation that um, I and the Commission have been dealing with uh, over, over the number of years. And, um, but tonight I'd like to talk about, a bit about the changes I've observed in my time and in what we do and how we regulate. And as Matthew has said, some of the change, challenges I think that exist for us as a regulator, 
for the industry and for wider society, including uh, politicians. And the philosophical background or origins, of course, were in the Budd Report. And I think, as, as Alan Budd also commented recently at, a, at, a, at a, another meeting, the, the, the issues around consumer welfare, choice and protection, um, the greater choice for individuals and, and uh, increased opportunity for gambling um, are still there. The central dilemma, the balance between enabling the consumer and protecting the consumer actually is still the central dilemma that we face. I, I joined uh, the Commission in 2011. Um, I remind people it was April Fool's Day um, and probably, uh, probably shouldn't really remind them of that. But by then, the Commission was well established as the successor to the Gaming Board. Um, it had been in operation, I think, for nearly six years. Um, it established itself. I think it had a very uh, strong domestic credibility, plus a very high international reputation, uh, led by Jenny Williams. Uh, it was outcome-based. It is outcomes-based, uh, proportionate, evidence-based, risk-based. Uh, those, those issues, those, those principles still very much guide the Commission. It had been building its database, developing its knowledge, uh, changing its approach to compliance policies from the old gaming board approach, and of course managing an external environment, an external environment which still to this day, but certainly then, saw uh, the ambivalent um, attitude of society and politicians to gambling, both domestically and globally. And in the key area, which I'm going to talk a fair bit about tonight, of gambling-related harm and problem gambling, there was a lack of evidence on the one hand about uh, how to deal with the issue, uh, and on the other hand, the certainty of how to deal with it from many genuine campaigners, plus, dare I say it, a few cynical and ignorant people as well. Uh, the challenge for research, education and treatment was laid down and was clear from the start, and the structures and funding issues were laid out, I think, very clearly in a report by, that Rachel Lampard uh, produced for, for the Commission right, right in its early days. Um, funding issues derive from the fact that the government has never chosen to implement a levy, and therefore the structures come from how do you raise money and deliver the sorts of services that are needed in, in this area. Um, from the fairly close to the start of my time, the structure we ended up with was a tripartite structure. The Responsible Gambling Strategy Board sets a strategy, advises the Commission, the Responsible Gambling Trust, an independent charity, funded entirely by um, voluntary subscriptions from the industry, delivers um, services around that strategy, so issues around, services around research, education uh, and treatment. And the Gambling Commission is involved with both of them and has a responsibility actually to tell the Secretary of State whether this, um, this whole um, structure actually works. Uh, <clears throat> when I turned up, I mean, I, it, it was quite interesting and, and I think it's important to say this, um, the attitude of the industry was, uh, was exemplified by someone who said to me, well, of course we, don't, we want, don't like problem gamblers. We don't want them in our business. They're bad for business. And those that there are, there's GAMCare. Right? And we fund GAMCare. So what's the problem, basically? Um, now, I have a great deal of respect for GAMCare. Um, but what was very clear was there wasn't, at that point, there was not serious engagement, in my view, uh, in, in the whole question of, of prevention, no question really of, of research. And there has been, my view, a significant change from the industry in, in this area, and one that people need to recognise and, and, and applaud the work so far. Uh, I'll come back to how far there is still to go. Um, one of the challenges, of course, for us that time, and continuing challenges, is that it's a very divisive or divided or competitive, whatever word you share to choose, industry. And there's a lot. It's a broad uh, range of activities, um, from lotteries to casinos, um, the, through the bookmakers um, area. So breadth of activities, to say competitive ones, compet and certainly interest. But it's fair to say that uh, I suppose the dominant um, issue in, in, for many people during my time and, and still is a very powerful issue is the issue around FOBTs, fixed odds betting terminals. And I think the nature and quality of the debate on FOBTs has is, 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 is been a challenging one. I mean, there's clearly, um, <coughs> pardon me, still 
um, a lack of, 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 I think, real evidence in this area, and it's something we need to return to urgently, in my view. There are also the different motives of, of the various parties who wish to um, pre present their views. There's the competitors, who at times aren't quite sure whether they'd like to have FOBTs, or they'd actually like to get rid of them. Um, there's local authorities, who in many cases actually simply want to reduce the number of of gambling premises on the high street um, and see getting rid of FOBTs as, or reducing stakes in FOBTs as a method of doing that. There are some genuine important campaigners uh, seeking to reduce gambling related harm and of course there are people who are simply anti-gambling. Anti the Commission has always recognised that there are some real issues around this but the evidence as I say has been very difficult and for sure the speed and ability of us to to respond to some of this and deliver the sort of evidence uh, on this and the, and the research on this is, has been limited by the fact of the structure, the, the tripartite structure, which is frankly not ideal, despite the fact that we work very well with both the RGSP and, uh, and with, with RGT. And I'll, again, I'll come back to that. And also with the funding. And frankly, the funding, when, when it needs to be addressed very squarely, the funding Rachel Lampard, when she, when she wrote her report, said very clearly, you know, we should be looking at £10 million pounds funding, right? minimum. Right? Funding at the minute, I think, the last figure I saw was £6.5 million. Right? And I think that, when we come back to looking at what we need to do in the future, addressing that funding issue um, is a really critical point. Fixed odds betting terminals are a hard form of gambling. They changed the risk pyramid, the pyramid of risk which was set up, which was intended out of, by BUD, and there is lots of anecdotal evidence of legitimate concern about the harm they may or may not be causing. It's really important we take a serious look at this. It's really important that we examine the evidence. I personally think that stake reduction may, not well, may well not be the answer, almost certainly is not, simply on its own. But I think it needs to be, we need to examine it and examine it coldly and clearly. Right? I think the IGSB strategy document, which I hope many of you in this room, if not all of you, have read, deals with some of the complexities of, of the issue, and it is a complex issue. Um, but there are also issues beyond FOBTs. Um, I haven't got it with me, but I, I, the first time I met Sarah Bridge of the Daily Mail, the Consumer Correspondent of the Daily Mail, I was, she wrote about me waving my phone in front of her and saying, there's my gambling machine. So let's remember that that's a gambling machine, that online is, an, an, is, is a critical part of this whole um, uh, area. Um, and also, if you look in, in the shops, in, in uh, bookmakers themselves, the rise of self-service betting terminals. Now, we know that, you know, from the figures, um, the figures say that problem gambling numbers are overall pretty static over the period. But again, let's not kid ourselves. That, they, that actually there are not limitations about how you measure problem gambling in a self-reported um, survey. Let's not kid ourselves that the normalization of gambling may indeed change how people answer those questions. And let's not kid ourselves that the variation, particularly with young people as opposed to the average, shows significantly higher numbers. Um, let's not kid ourselves that we're dealing about risk as well. It's easy to talk about this small number, but you need to think about and consider that element of, of the population who um, are at risk or who binge gamble right? uh, and gamble just with too much money over a short period of time. In other words, it's not simply a question of harm as measured by the rate of problem gambling. The issue for us is to actually understand what gambling related harm means and what it means for the player, for his or her family, and for society in a broader basis. <clears throat> At the same time, of course, we've seen the growth of digital and the, and, and the impact of digital. The industry figures, latest ones I saw, said 29% of uh, uh, gross gambling yield um, came from remote uh, revenue, 43% if you simply look at commercial gambling and, and ignore the national lottery. And I saw a figure, uh, I think it was Mark Davis's blog, that said 70% of that was mobile. Um, so that, the, the machine in my pocket, is of course transformative for us all, transformative for the betting and gaming business, transformative for us as a regulator, transformative for the government in the way they want to deal with it. 
We've seen, I think, the normalization of gambling, its, its availability, the growth of advertising. I, I, there was a figure I saw recently that TV advertising uh, is up from 80 million to almost 120 million pounds a year in the last three years. But actually, TV advertising, it's easy to get hooked up on that and the, and the, and the codes of practice. The reality is that you, know, you look at online, you look at shirt sponsorship, you look at sp uh, program sponsorship numbers, you look at um, perimeter advertising, Right? You look at the sponsorship of events. Right? There is an extraordinary sort of normalization of gambling, which one needs to recognize the nature of that engagement and the potential impact it has. Equally, one sees through this, um, if you like, our online world, the pressures on existing land-based businesses, for sure. You know, the, the growth of self-service betting terminals and the importance of FOBTs, to, for example, to, to, to bookmakers is important. Um, what you also see is the pressure on people's business models and the, the fun and games the Commission has had over that wonderful term called primary purpose. Um, and that's basically a function of people trying to, to push the business model as hard as they could. Uh, so the arguments about machine entitlements, the arguments that Green King are still um, engrossed with, with us over, over um, uh, bingo in, in, in pubs. Um, so, I mean, the, the issue here, you know, about business models um, is, is an important one. There's also increasingly the issue about sports betting integrity. And sports betting integrity, in one level, is, is not so far, thank goodness, a major issue in this country. But be aware of the size and nature of the markets in Southeast Asia and the betting markets and the size of those and the impact they have on a global basis in a, di in a digital world. And of course, what we're also seeing connected to that, uh, as well as separate from it, is, is, is questions around money laundering. Okay. So, so <clears throat> two, two things, of course, very specific things happened to the Commission in, 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 in my time. One <clears throat> is the, we took on the regulation of the National Lottery now, the National Lottery is the business of regulating a monopoly. Um, I sometimes compare it to trying to regulate the BBC as opposed to trying to regulate television in, more gen in general terms. Um, it's a much more intrusive form of regulation. Um, it also has this wonderful extra duty, which is quite an odd duty for a regulator in some ways, which is about maximizing good cause revenue, re the revenue that goes to good causes. It's a very important part of the license, very important part for us, um, for the Commission. And we also have a broader stewardship role on behalf of, if you like, the citizen to protect the, 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 the overall national lottery. The national lottery has been very successful in terms of its contribution to good causes. Um, it's very important to national life, but let's be clear, there is a global pressure on lottery, on lotteries as a whole, and lotto. Right? There's some real challenges. Um, there's the need for the, com and you have seen some of the changes that have been made, and these changes are also about uh, developing new games. They're also about reflecting that it's a digital world, and that, the, that Camelot as an operator has had to really look at how it runs its business, and we have had to look as a regulator as to how that, as how that works. So you've got to increase, you've got to move to digital, you've got to increase complexities of the games, and the challenge then becomes a broader strategic challenge of maintaining the National Lottery's distinctiveness in this world, as well as maintaining its, and growing its returns to good causes. And that's a, that's a challenge. Right? We also, as you will know, now regulate all uh, remote gambling 2014, um, despite the best efforts of Gibraltar, um, we now uh, managed to be the regulator for that. It was important um, for us as a commission because it was important to delivering our overall agenda and our objectives in the world of digital. Um, it's helped us with information gathering. It's helped us with uh, sports betting integrity issues. And I'll come back to a couple of other things which we've developed really and w without which we, the, the, um, the overall gambling responsibilities we could not have been able to develop. It's important to say it's a... Different, there's a very different regime for remote and land-based gambling. It has implications, therefore, for us in regulating land-based gambling and the limits. If you look at it, land-based gambling is based around uh, pretty crude controls about stakes and prizes. Right? And it's a broad approach, whereas online is very much an individual approach to it. And, and the stakes and prizes regime, of course, is, is totally different, as is the tax regime. 
Um, so we're also faced, frankly, uh, and it's a challenge for, for us, we are, we're regulating the global industry, and the thing that kept us all awake, I, I won't be thought about it, and I think probably those still involved uh, deeply still does, are the unknown unknowns, frankly. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld lives um, uh, and breathes in this world, um, and that certainly in the licensing process, and where we've turned license, been investigating and turning licenses away, there have been some very, um, how can I put it politely, some very rum businesses, let's put it more than that. Um, throughout the existence of, of the Commission, cooperation has been a key, right? But actually now, with the world we live in, cooperation has increased, and the importance of cooperation has increased significantly with other gambling regulators, with law enforcement nationally and internationally, with local authorities with whom we've had a, we have a very, very good close relationship, with global digital platforms. Very interesting, when we took the online regulation, we established some very good, strong relationships with people like Google and PayPal and, other, and, and, and the payment providers, and that's been really important for us. And consumer regulators, as we look towards increasing our emphasis on consumer regulation, the, the relationship with, say, for example, the CMA is a, is a very important and growing one. But our fundamental approach has remained, and, and remains the same, the responsibility is on the industry, underpinned by codes, with a very clear expectation of compliance on a principle-based approach. It's about an incentive to develop, the industry to develop its responses and its regulatory approach against the threat of exposure. Um, so let me mention three specific things that we're, we're, we're talking about which are quite, quite important. One, in terms of what we currently, what we've been doing over the past couple of years. One is, is an audit-based approach to, a, to high impact operators, the major operators. Right? And that ability to go in and look in detail in an audit type approach and look at really detailed uh, compliance work about their systems and processes is really important in really properly engaging the industry. Um, secondly, um, regulatory settlements. <clears throat> now, regulatory settlements are, are part of the toolkit that we, that we have. Um, the intention behind them has been to be targeted high impact interventions. There's a presumption in favour of such settlements because they're proportional in terms of cost to the Commission and time involvement. The theory behind them is very simple. They are, provide you with a, a much more effective way of achieving the aim and one of the aims of regulatory settlements has been to learn, for people to learn lessons. Okay? Um, it's not an object, the object of the exercise is not for people to incur lesser penalties. I think that's quite, quite an important thing to, 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 to grasp. It's an incentive, in some ways, for the industry. It would be fair to say that, we, you know, that we've had a number of these uh, over recent years and collected quite a lot of money, in some cases for good, good causes. Um, however, I mean, I, I believe, and I know the Commission believes as a whole, that we're not, this needs to be re-looked at. Um, because the question of lessons learned, you could argue, in some cases, don't seem to be happening. And we need to look at that. And I know the Commission is looking at that. And it, I, if I'm a betting man, of course I'm not, um, the, the, my suspicion is that the people would be looking to increasing the, the impact of penalties on, on, on people if they don't learn the lessons. Right, so the balance need, it needs to be, be thought about quite carefully. The third um, thing I want, I want to mention to you, um, which I think is very important uh, uh, part of our regulatory toolkit, is the annual assurance statement. <clears throat> now, the annual assurance statement is very much about changing people's behaviours. Right? We've run a pilot this year. It's not, about, it's not the same thing as just supplying a number of extra pieces of information about your regulatory returns. It, the idea is it's a short statement, of rather like the financial statement of internal control. It's designed to get the operators to give, us, to give us their views of their performance versus the licensing objectives and the progress they're making towards achieving those licensing objectives where there are weaknesses. But it is also fundamentally, and this is a really important thing for me, it's about holding the boards of companies and the owners of companies to account. Right? Too often, I think, you know, the, the engagement, and it's been seen by the industry, that they engage with the commission at compliance manager level. Right? Now, first of all, I think it's important they do. Secondly, I think it's very important, by the way, that we also begin to hold all um, 
of our, our license, personal license holders much more to account. But fundamentally, I believe it's important that we hold boards to account. I think we should, you know, we're talking about the chairs of boards, we're talking about the audit and risk committee, we're talking about the remuneration committee. Right? And once we begin to do that, I think we then begin to see the chance of real change occurring in their approach to, to, regu to regulation. The evidence of the first year is that, um, to put it politely, we have some way to go, I think would be the way I'd put it. Um, and I know that the Commission is going to uh, come back to people and have some workshops in the second half of the year and then decide what happens in the context of next year. Um, I hope those, um, look forward to hearing about those workshops being very constructive. So um, let me move on a little bit to talking about some of the challenges that I now see for us, for government and politicians. Um, as we seek to manage this balance that I've talked about. Context is very straightforward. Changing consumer behaviour, the impact particularly on the young and vulnerable of, of the te digital technology, the, th the threats and risks from uh, sports betting integrity, um, the, the whole question here of, um, of new products and, 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 and players um, and, and businesses beginning to... Um, develop in, in this area. Um, one classic example, which is causing us um, a fair bit of time of consideration in the room, is the whole question of eSports. You know, it's a whole issue. It's eSports, which is basically playing computer games competitively. The last estimates I saw was 150 million global audience, um, $500 million global revenue this year, estimated from Deloitte's a $56 million betting market last year, and we know that a number of our major operators are already involved in it. There's clearly, you know, some, re some quite interesting issues about skill and chance about what's gambling around this area. There's also a link, of course, to gaming and social gaming, therefore a link to young people. And the whole area here is an area of um, real interest and increasing concern for, for us. Um, the other two areas I just mentioned at this point in context term, there is a need for a broader understanding of gambling-related harm. Right? It's to, we need to get beyond problem gambling and problem gamblers to a concept of gambling-related harm. And we need to also in the context, and I'll come back to this again, we need to look at this in the context of a public health issue. And therefore, we also therefore need to think, and the challenge for us all is about the credibility of the funding that goes into this and the credibility of the research that we're going to have to do on this. <clears throat> now, for, let me just cover three, briefly the three, three bits of us, bits of the Gambling Commission. Now, the, I know that Sarah and the team are developing their, own, their strategy, but here are some um, slightly random thoughts um, of me and what some of the challenges are for, for my um, fellow commissioners and, and the commission go, going forward. We're clearly, the, the poor evidence is, is a real challenge for us in trying to understand what's truly going on. And we need to stop or find a way of not being caught between an unwillingness to actually engage and deal with this and a sort of an overall hostility to gambling. Right? We need to build some expertise, continue to build expertise in, in financial world. We're, we're in a fintech world. You know, if you look at, um, and it's quite interesting, if you look at some of the companies, you know, the, the, the bigger ones, they've got trading rooms, they've got quants, just like trading, and they employ people. I mean, I know um, Paddy Park Betfair employs people straight out of a UCD who have got computer science and maths degrees. That's the way they think about this world, and we've got to be aware of, of how we're deal, dealing with that. We need to work and push the agenda with our GSB and our GT, driving the RGSB strategy. I'm delighted that Kate Lampard has um, been appointed as chair of IGT. Um, it would be fair to say that there's been all sorts of um, issues, I think, pretty many cases, very unfair issues about the independence of RGT. But Kate's appointment, and I know her, what the way she'll approach things, will put the question of independence beyond doubt. The challenge will be funding, and the challenge will be for the industry, to fund the RGSB strategy and for us to keep pushing them at that and to make sure this tripartite agreement can work. Um, and therefore, in that context, building, building public confidence. Um, in, in, we also need to continue to work with industry in a cooperative way. Right? I think it is about cooperative. It's about having adult conversations with them. It's about engaging with them. But equally, we need to manage that in the context of being quite tough 
in, in holding people to account for breaches and quite tough when people do not learn the lessons they say they're going to learn. We've always had a, fun, a, a focus on consumers, uh, but clearly there's an increased focus, I think, needed on consumers and consumer protection around advertising, the whole issue around bonuses and offers and stuff like that, therefore around the terms and conditions. There's some quite tricky area, areas, I think, still around the management of, of um, customer funds. Partnerships will remain vital. In fact, will increasingly be important, the, these partnerships that we've got to, we've got to build. Um, I think the other great... And, and, I've written this word down, agility, and agility is one of those words which, frankly, is a bit like Brexit. It can mean whatever you want it to mean. Um, but um, in this context, agility means our ability to respond um, quickly to changes and to, not, to understand what's going on, built on a very sound foundation of what we stand for and how we approach things. Right? And we need to be able to deal and respond to those changing behaviours and the changing regulatory implications. We also need, and the industry uh, quite probably expects us, to, to manage our costs, continue to manage our costs. We, if you look at the latest fee proposals, you can see that we're very conscious of that in the industry and, and the, the regulator, as a regulator, will continue to be very conscious of that. And that's important, I think, because the overall cost of regulation, both if you like, in, 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 a, in the broadest sense, is a critical issue because we mustn't drive people into illegal markets and we mustn't make it impossible for the legitimate operator to compete fairly. Right? The final thing for us is um, that I believe it's really important that we become the authoritative voice in this space. One of the things that complete, as colleagues will know completely infuriated me recently was um, a two-page spread in the Times. Right? And it was basically using the campaign for fairer gambling's material. Now, I have a great deal of respect for the campaign for fairer gambling and its effectiveness and what it's done. And I don't blame the Times for going and talking to them. What I find extraordinarily frustrating was that we got a phone call at five o'clock the night before publication for what I'd call the paragraph 17 denial. Right? Um, we need to be the phone call, first phone call. When someone comes to the Times, they need to be willing to understand, and so do politicians, that see the commissions, the place that holds the data, the information, and can help people make their own judgments in a, in a, neutral, in a neutral way. Right? And that, I think, is an important thing going forward as we try to create a space in which we can have a positive, sensible discussion and then action in, in, the, in this area. Now, in, in terms of the government, I think what I, the government has overall responsibility for this area, of course. And all I would ask the government to do is, please, please, could we have a coherent approach? Um, I was saying earlier that in my five years, I've had four secretaries of state, um, three uh, different gambling ministers and three different um, civil service teams. Now, and the, the Secretaries of State, by the way, have varied from the completely indifferent to the very involved, as have the gambling ministers. And they're all, by the way, from the same party. Right? Um, and I think that's a, it's, 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 it's an issue for, for that. I think, you know, I was very disappointed, frankly, to see the, the DCMS single departmental plan. I think there was one line in it about, about gambling. And a pretty broad, let me put it in one, this pretty broad KPI. Um, so I, there's a set of issues here. There's issues around the young and the vulnerable. There's an issues around, which I haven't really talked about tonight, about account-based play, which I think is, is actually something which we need to come back to in the context of, of how we deal with um, risk and machines. Um, I think, you know, so... That sort of area, I think, is, is really important for us. I think f f what we want for them, for the DCMS, for politicians and the media more generally, is this willingness to engage really with the evidence. It's a challenge for us and the government to get people to, d to do that. I think we also, to be fair, I think that you know, the government and us need to recognise and engage that, the, that there are parts of the industry that have made real progress. And there are many people in the industry who, who are you know, genuinely very concerned about that. I think what I'm, what I'm saying here is that could we please have some joined up strategic thinking within the DCMS. For example, there's a digital part of the DCMS, um, which there's also a child protection part of the DCMS. So there's, there's a minister, Matt Hancock, who looks after digital. There's Diana Shields, who, who looks after child protection. And there's a gambling minister. Right? I would urge the three of them to sit, perhaps even sit in the room, 
talk about it, talk about the implications of this and, and what actually goes on. I also would urge them to engage with the Department of Health. Right? There's a, I saw today there's a big extra sum of money going into mental health services. I hope some of it will be allowed to be engaged with issues around gambling and gambling-related harm. Right? Um, so that public health agenda is, is, is really, really important. Um, in the very short term, medium term, I hope there's been talk for some time of a gambling review. Um, I hope there is one. I, it goes back to what I said about FOBTs, but I think that review, I hope, is a broad-based review. I hope it reflects and maybe and ties into the life chances agenda, which seems to be uh, aligned at the moment. I, I hope it's not a narrow-based review. Um, I think the Commission, I know, stands absolutely ready and willing and anxious to engage with, 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 the, with that process. Um, finally, very important area, which is the National Lottery. Um, it is easy, again, you know, to forget the importance of the National Lottery to national life and the implications of that. And I, you know, um, there are challenges to its growth, as I said. There are challenges coming from increasing co competition and challenges from different habits. Um, again, that needs to be looked at. It needs to be looked at also in the context of the whole lottery sector as, as a whole. Um, so, if I then move to what I, the, end, the challenges on, on, the, on the industry, I think that's recognize, the industry needs to recognise, of course, there's an increasing drumbeat, an understandable drumbeat of concern, um, about, particularly about machines. Um, but there's a broader issue, I think, about normalisation of gambling as well. There's a reduction, we see the numbers, there's a reduction in trust in gambling. Um, it's quite significant drop over recent years. On the other hand, there are increasing pressures on the business. Um, one can see that particularly if, if any land-based uh, business is under extraordinary pressures in whatever sector you're in when you look at this, di this digital world. Um, there's also a question, I think, for the industry about the reputation, right, which it needs to think very carefully about. I think investors are getting more concerned about, um, in, 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 about the reputation of businesses. I think the, one of the most interesting things I heard recently was the other day I was with a, um, a chief executive of one of the major companies, and he was saying they'd just done a staff survey, and they were really very surprised, particularly amongst their younger people, the concern that they had to work for a company that was socially responsible. Right? They, it was a very, it really was a way, you know, if you want to be completely cynical and practical about it, that was a real wake-up call, I think, for, 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 that, for that group of people. And I, so, and I think, you know, businesses need to be aware of that for sure. I think there are many businesses, and there are some people I, I see here tonight, in, in all sectors who actually care very deeply about their customers and their relationships with the communities in which they operate. But there's real leadership required from the industry here. And I think that is about culture change from the top, building on the change of progress, changes that have been made and the progress that's been made. I, change at the top is one thing, but actually it's a real business about, about changing inside an organisation. And you know, there are four things you, I think you need inside the organisation to look at change. You, need, you do need the role modelling at the top. You do need training and development. You do need systems and processes in place that allow people to do this stuff. And you do need incentives, right? And those incentives need to be monetary incentives, but they're all right, they're all right, the broad sense of rewards. So those sorts of issues need to be dealt with. And that means real board and real ownership engagement. I think, you know, it also means it, 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 the leadership of key players. That, I mean, I've heard it referred to as the coalition of the sensible. Um, the top 10 players account for almost 75% of gross gaming yield, 87% of um, land-based gambling. Now, I think, <clears throat> don't, don't get me wrong, I think um, the trade bodies uh, can play a very important role, but I think it's the leadership of these people, uh, these chief executives, who are really meaning that they're actually going to make some sort of change here in terms of the way they want to approach this. And they've got to recognise that they're also the impact of the sheer amount and the salience of the marketing and the impact that may have on, and potentially on vulnerable. And they've also got to be truthful about their business model, right? You know, how much of their business model is dependent on not simply frequent players, but how much they're prepared to really look at, at people who are seriously at risk and what they're prepared to do about that. And what, what are their values in, in, in that context if they, if they truly want to be, if they truly want to build and develop long-term sustainable businesses. Um, so it's about 
addressing that. It's about being, being open with yourself about that. It's about working together. There's lots of stuff going on. I, I, you know, we encourage, and I think it's terrific, in testing some of the ideas and some of the stuff that's around, evaluating it. But it's also about sharing best practice, open to sharing best practice with each other, with the IGT, with us. Um, and it's about funding and supporting the IGSB strategy. Um, I mean, there's a, you know, we, if they're going to build public confidence and provide the information necessary to really drive higher standards, then they've got to be prepared to fund this strategy. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a whole debate about levies and things like that. I have heard it said by one, by one member of the industry, and I won't name him in case he gets lynched, uh, that there's an argument for a levy because at least it gets rid of free riding. Right? And there's certainly an issue here that some people are contributing more. And there's a real issue that people need to properly think about, I think, on that side. So, um, that's it, really. The Bud Dilemma still sits there. Privacy and freedom versus the, versus the nanny state. The basic principles of our approach have to remain the same, but the impact of, of, the impact of technology, the changes in consumer behavior, all provide a change in context, and the, and the political context quite understandably, about, about protection, is, is the temperature there is properly raising. The government needs a comprehensive approach. The industry needs to properly engage and build and delight, and, and people in the industry need to provide leadership. The commission needs to push on these, to continue to, to have the dialogue, to continue to provide um, that, that leadership as well, and, and to engage and provide good advice and work with our GSB and our GT, and to hold people to account publicly and, if necessary, with money. And you've got to recognise, of course, you know, that there will be trade-offs. Pragmatic trade-offs will exist because this is a hugely complicated area. It doesn't even need to tell many of the people, people in this room. So that's what I've got to say, except for one thing. I've been very fortunate to work in the Commission for the last five years. It's, um, I've had some great colleagues in, on, as commissioners. I've had two great chief executives and Jenny Williams and Sarah Harrison, and there were a great bunch of people. And if I ever get annoyed about stuff, it's when I see people um, unleashing unnecessary and stupid personal attacks on those individuals. Because um, they work damned hard, they care what they do, and they're doing really important work. So thank you for listening. I look forward to conversations. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're running a bit over time, so I'll, um, uh, I'll ask you a couple of questions, but I'll ask you to be kind of quite brief in, in your responses to those so that we can, we can open it up to the room. I mean, at listening to your speech, it confirmed for me why it is I wanted you to speak. Because a couple of people have said to me, why is the RSA holding this event? And the reason I wanted to hold the event is it seems to me that this industry and the way in which it is developing and innovating and globalizing and growing and the way in which it touches on so many different issues and parts of our lives is something which deserves and requires a much more sophisticated approach than we've currently got at the moment because I think in the sense what we've got is a, is a kind of a, a kind of industry which at its worst just wants to be able to get on and make money as you know, as best as it can and works in a highly competitive environment and people and then some people who who are opposed to gambling and I understand that being opposed to gambling but it's like being opposed to drinking or being opposed to smoking you know it's a legitimate position but it, it doesn't help us in a way resolve the policy dilemmas that we've got in the face of people who want to do this stuff and have wanted to do this stuff through history I think so therefore my question is do you in the end this is about a license to operate you know that's what we're talking about here do you think yet the industry kind of understands the concept of a license to operate, in aggregate a license to operate? Is that something which the industry has a, as a whole understands and has, has a grasp on? Well, <clears throat> I'll try to be brief. Two, two things. One, um, th it's difficult to say the industry. I mean, I know I use the word industry, but this is, you know, there are very different approaches and beliefs, I think, in different parts of it. Right? Um, Secondly, having said that, I think what we have talked about, and I've talked about, and colleagues have talked about at times, has been the concept of a social license. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if people, if the industry wants to develop and to innovate, 
right, in the world you're talking about, then it needs to be aware of the need to have a social license. And I'm not sure it does completely. And how much of, that, just, how much of that, Philip, is a collective action problem in the sense that you're talking about a highly diverse global industry there's no point some bits of it having a notion of a social license so the rest of it doesn't, because in the end they'll behave ethically and get screwed by people who don't want to behave well, ethically. Uh, so is it a collective action challenge? I mean, that's, that's a perfectly fair challenge, to which I, of course, what I would say to you is that you've still got a situation where 70%, was it 70, 80% of the industry is in the hands of quite a small number of people, right? And that leadership and that brand, and you know, it, it applies on, on any digital world, and the interesting question is, you know, do you set yourself out as an industry and a group of people to provide an eth for want of a better word, an ethical approach to it, right? And use that as a as a business model. There's a small company called Tombola at the moment, which a number of people in this room will know, and their business model is based around being socially responsible. They seem to be, in their world, reasonably successful. And I just wonder, you know, I mean, that's the challenge. I recognise that, as I say, the dilemma is that, you know, you, you, you've exactly got the situation of making it too expensive or easy for people to get involved with unscrupulous operators, um, and and that that remains the challenge. But you know, um, I'm not. I, I think the power of the brand, and I think the power of or, or, or the size of some of these businesses, I think they have a they have an opportunity to do something about that and take that on. And then final question for me before I open it up, which is. Is part of this just about being absolutely clear about what fundamentally takes place in the interaction between the gambling industry and consumers? Which is to say that, that in the end, gambling is a form of psychological manipulation. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that the gambling industry should always say that 99% of people who gamble in the end will lose. But this is simply the truth. In the same way as you know, if you smoke, it's going to be bad for you at some level or another. And then if you drink more than a couple of drinks, you will not be able to drive very well. It's a simple, basic truth. And the, when you look at, and it is a bit shocking that there's six million pounds a year spent on research into problem gambling and 120 million pounds spent on TV ad, ads for gambling. That doesn't sound like an industry that's quite got its head around these issues. But um, I, I know quite a lot about psychology. So I know that things like bet in play, I know the way that fixed odds weight terminals were, I know the way that adverts in the evenings, which suggest to you that gambling is part of having a good night out, these are all very carefully honed psychological devices, messages, all designed in a way to take away from the underlying reality, which is gambling is something which is fun, but it's basically not a good life choice. And that's the truth. I mean, it's fun, but it's not a good life choice. Well, I mean, so tell me at what point you wish to get in the way of people making their life choices here. I mean, just trying to I suppose struggle I'm, a bit. I, I, mean, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, is there a basic underlying reality that people... No, nobody right. would say who smokes is good for me, or it's occasionally good for me. They just say it's, you know, it's, it, there's a degree. I choose to smoke even so, though I know it's bad for me. Yes. There, there are a number of products and a number of people, right, who are at risk from gambling, right, and gambling excessively. There are equally, in fact, there's a lot more people who go to casinos, play the lottery, go to arcades, right? go to betting shops, and enjoy themselves. It's, I mean, it's a recreation. At what point, I, I'm just struggling here as to, as to what point you wish to, I mean, the, the underlying reality is that there's a, there's a, there, is a, there are risks in, in the, and, and, and the regulation and the approach to gambling recognizes there are risks, and those risks vary by people and by situation. But there's lots of people in lots of situations and lots of places where um, people enjoy themselves and, and, and they spend money gambling. This is the point, Philip. This is exactly the point I'm trying to get to. Now, I am going to open up, but this is the point. When it comes to smoking, and probably now alcohol, we don't say there are risks. We say it's bad for you, which doesn't mean you can't choose to do it. You can't mean that you don't have a good time having a drink. If some people enjoy smoking. It's a choice you make, but be under no illusions. It's probably not very good for you. But as gambling, we're kind of saying it's not, it's not bad for you, except for those people who undertake risky behaviour. Is that the nub of the issue? Well, I mean, I, 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 look, correct me if I'm wrong, but smoking potentially kills you, right? Everybody. Right? I'm not sure everybody who gambles is potentially affected. Right? I'm not sure everybody who drinks. Uh, so I've, I mean, I think people, you know, there are risks about drinking, right? And people accept that. And yeah, there are limits on what you what you can do. And you, there sh so there so there should be. But I mean, um, I don't think somehow that makes it. I mean, from my perspective, you know, it's it is legitimate leisure activity. It has risks. Right? Those risks need to be identified. Um, they need to be owned, right? 
uh, but it doesn't get in the way of people, lots of people, um, providing f fun, entertainment, um, and, people in and lots of people enjoying themselves. Great, thank you. Uh, right, let's take some points around the, the room. Uh, we'll take a few together. Yep. Um, just on the last point, the highlight of my grandparents' week uh, when they lived on nothing but the state pension was doing the pools at, at the weekend, and it in fact brought them a lot of utility in their life. Um, my question for Philip is, um, we tend to regulate traditional sectors in a very micro way based specifically on their business models, and then the new online sector, which covers in fact nearly all the other sectors but in an online format, is regulated very differently and slightly more openly. Do you think trying to regulate by sector is the way forward or should we perhaps look for more general regulation that applies across the board equally? No, go on, okay. on. They, they, um, they, 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 It's quite a complex question. So yes. <laughs> and we're both of an age, we might have forgotten it by some yes. the third one. So, yeah. No, I'm just worried that the answer to it will take up the entire time I've got, actually. No, no. no, uh, um, yes or I, no? Look, there is, there is clearly a, um, a, a, um, an issue here about, as I said when I was talking, about the issue of land based gambling. Gambling is regulated in, in quite a very specific way, right? And, and online is not. I think the questions around online. I think you know we need to look. We, we need to think and use, and the industry needs to use technology to help us in that world to begin to recognise some of the risks that go with play online, which are being which are addressed in very in, in, in very broad brush terms in the land based basis. Right? I, I think the reality is that I do not see in any time soon. Famous famous last words as basically change the basic. You know, there's land based and there's, on, and, and there's online in terms of the regulatory thing. I don't think there's going to be any good appetite for governments, governments to do that. I think it's, a, it's an absolutely fair, fair challenge and a, and a difficult area. The, the final point I just made briefly is, of course, that the, that the online industry would argue that it's got much clearer ways of identifying people and therefore managing risk than people who operate on a land based and more anonymous basis. And that's a, you know, another debate. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks. I think I might have a slightly uh, different background here. I actually work in a school. I'm responsible for well-being. I'm also a mathematician. Have been a, uh, a poker player at various points. But um, it, it's uh, it's in with authority then. It, well, <laughs> it, it's it's interesting um, when I hear when you're sort of attacking uh, gambling, Matthew. And, and I think uh, I'm interesting whether, whether there's something that we can do with schools, perhaps in, in the education, that's a bit more positive uh, as well as as well as looking at the dangers because when you talk about all the, all the terrible things about gambling actually I teach mathematics as well and you know and to teach my students to learn about risk to manage risk to, to really get a, a, a good gra grapple on it of course with a with a with a, a thing that says also don't don't gamble you're too young and it's, it's dangerous but uh, but but it's it seems to be wrapped up Quite, quite negatively sometimes, and uh, and, I, and I wonder, you know, there's a big gap in well-being. We talk about drugs and we talk about uh, alcohol, and we don't tell them, well, you must never do this. We t we, t we talk about how to do it responsibly, and there seems to be a big void in gambling. We don't have many resources or things available there uh, of of that thing, which is not don't do it, but do it responsibly. And can we combine that with maths? Can we combine it with other things? I just wondered if that was a yeah. I'm, I'm, let me, I'm not attacking gambling. Yeah. I'm saying is yes. the fundamental story we're telling about gambling one that. That, that gets across to people at that framework for understanding it. But go on. Yeah, the short answer to your question is yes. I mean, I think we should. Although, although I, I warned myself and you that the Daily Mail headline of, you know, schools now teaching gambling is one I think we've just got to be aware of. But understanding... It was pretty rife in my school, I have yes, to say. Yes, well, of course. That's the, that's the other side. I think there's an awful lot of self-learning goes on here uh, in, term, in terms of uh, um, various forms of ev everything from, you know, playing at home for matchsticks to some serious all-night stuff goes on around poker. Um, but um, I do think that, you know, finally, I do think it fits into the public health agenda. I think you're quite right to raise that. And that's really one of the, one of the challenges, I think, for us is to put those risks, right, and those issues into a broader public health context, just as smoking and, and, and alcohol is as well. Yep. Oh, there's a couple. Oh, sorry. Sorry, that's my fault for not looking. Sorry. Um, you spoke, Philip, about... Um, the evidence-led approach of the Commission, um, which is uh, very laudable, uh, I think, but you spoke <laughs> more about the absence of evidence. Mm. And I was just wondering at what point 
the evidence triggers the precautionary approach, which is something you didn't men mention at all. Mm -hmm. And getting, getting, getting an understanding of that, I think, will help very much in the debate around FOBTs. No, I, I, and, um, I think it's, a, it's an absolutely fair point, John. Uh, and I think, um, and I think that's one of the. I think that's why we just need to sit down and look, and 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 um, co set, set out what the evidence is and what the risks are. And it may be when you look at that and look at the balance, you, you adopt a precautionary approach. I'm not. I'm not. I mean, I. I think. I hope I made it clear that I think it will continue to be an issue to get. And I don't think we should just worry this to bits until we get the. There isn't, to coin a phrase, a final answer to this situation. And it may well be that given the risks and given the damage uh, and, and everything else, that you, one has to adopt a precautionary approach. But I think there's a bit of, it's, it, one of the implications, one of the issues is precautionary, in adopting it, what are you going to do? Right? It's not just, yeah, we need to do, it's for well said, we need to do something. What is it that will actually, is likely to have the best effect based on the present judgment? I think that's a, as big an issue as anything. And you, I mean, you put, look, you, 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 refer, you referred to, to, to evidence over and again in your speech. It was a recurrent theme. I mean, you know, isn't it pretty amazing that an industry which generates billions of pounds of profits, which is faced with quite a major public backlash, doesn't want to invest more in the kind of authoritative independent research which would enable it to defend itself? Um, you might, or, or to, you recon, might, or to you, recognize you, that some of its activities do, do need to change. You might well say that. Myself. Yeah, well, you said it, so I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm, just, uh, I'm just repeating it for you because you haven't quite finished your role yet. Um, okay, uh, uh, there was somebody there, yeah. We'll, yeah, and the glasses down, I'll take someone at the back. Yeah, hi there, Philip. Lee Willows uh, from YGAM. Yes. I've got an observation and a question for you. So my observation is uh, I set up YGAM as a UK registered charity yes. about a year ago as a former addict, and we go into schools and we train teachers how to deliver uh, this subject yes. to pupils, and we talk about informed choice. I think that's, that's sort of quite important, really. Um, but my observation is just to say, you know, sort of concurring with what you said earlier, the industry have absolutely stepped forward and really helped myself and our organisation to take a, a, a foothold in. That really needs to be recognised, so I, I do agree with that. And my question is, on that social mission that we have of delivering uh, interventions around minimising harm through preventive education, have you got any sort of insight or any advice, because we've got a lot of appetite, we've got a lot of teachers at our, at, at our doors to get involved, but as we scale up the organisation, we do not want to become that organisation who has that daily mail, uh, you know, sort of headline, why GAN teaches kids to gamble, which is not what we do. Have you got any advice on how we can sort of as avoid that? As a former newspaper man, there was one other yes. question. We'll take that because okay. then we'll have to finish. So let's okay. just take this from the question from the back room as well. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for that. I'm from the London Borough of Newham. Um, you mentioned local authorities throughout, yes. which was great because we are the people um, who have to listen to our residents yes. and the people that visit betting shops and use FABTs. Um, you may also be aware that we've led a campaign um, regarding the issue of FOBTs with um, a cross-party and nationwide coalition of local authorities near 100. Um, our campaign has focused on the fact that we are not anti-gambling per se. We understand that the casino in Newham brings growth and jobs to the borough. Our campaign is focused on regulation and it, and it goes to the point that you were making about where you draw the line between fun and then fun in a regulated environment. You said that stake reduction on FABTs was not necessarily what you considered the, 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 the solution to this issue. Um, but I ask why you think that £100 on an FABT, which is such an anomaly compared to other gaming machines, on a high street rather than in a regulated environment is appropriate. Um, my other tiny point, sorry to continue, is on evidence. Um, I leave you with the thought that in Newham, which is young, New London's youngest and most diverse borough, we have an incident of crime or antisocial behaviour associated with a betting shop that police are called out to every single day. Um, that then leads to different questions about a regulated environment. Great. Okay. There we are. Okay. Two final questions. Two final questions. I, knew, I told you there wouldn't be an easy audience. No. Uh, um, so, my, uh, Lee, my serious advice to you is to develop a very thick skin <laughs> um, and um, to, to, be, uh, to, to continue to... Uh, sorry, it's, it's, pretty, I mean, it's 
to continue to engage. It's, it's, I know that you've, you, you are someone who's been caught in the middle of some pretty tough stuff, right? And I think it's conversations and going and talking to schools and going to talking to schools associations and stuff. I mean, I mean the, the academies and people like academy chains, people like that. Yeah, absolutely, you should continue, continue to do that. As far as, far as the, 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 absolutely, the question about, about Newham, two things. One is that um, I, um, for sure, there are issues around, uh, social issues around um, betting shops and, and numbers. Right? I, I mean, I think there's a discussion as to whether whether there happen to be incidents that occur outside a betting shop because it happens to be on the high street, whether there are issues caused by the betting shop, right? I mean, I'm not, I mean, there's some discussion around that. I think it certainly is, it certainly is, is, is it, it certainly is an area which we are very mind, mindful of. Um, in terms of the £100 stake, I think it's just, in, in the context, I mean, I'm coming out from a slightly different perspective. I come from the point of view, you know, what are we trying to do in the context of reducing gambling-related harm, right? And I, first of all, I recognise that these machines are in, in betting shops are an anomaly. It was not, right? it was a deal that was done, right? The hundred-pound stake is is a, is is in terms of the evidence that we have got, is employed is actually um, used by a very small percentage of people. I'm concerned about, you know, if if we reduce stakes, will we reduce gambling-related harm? Right? Uh, I understand the arguments for how that 100-point stakes look anomalous, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that at all. What I, what I challenge is whether removing 100-point stakes, frankly, will make any difference to the incidence of gambling-related harm, which is the issue I'm concerned about. It may do, but I beg leave on the evidence I've seen to say there's a very small number of people who actually... Uh, bet £100 stakes. Well, thank you, Philip. So uh, thank you all for coming and for the questions that you've asked. My, uh, I know there's a lot of people from the industry here. Um, I would encourage you to continue to try to be part of the kind of debate that Philip has, has talked about. I remember once, many years ago, going to a meeting hosted by the CBI to discuss the private finance initiative when it was starting to go wrong. And there were two groups of people in the room. There was a group of people from the industry who said, we need to change the way the PFI works because it's going wrong and it's going to become discredited. And there was a group of people who said, no, we need, we need to make a video. Um, and it was the people who said, no, we need to make a video who won the argument. And history writes that PFI was one of the great disasters of British public policy. So what I would say to you is it's important to get out there and to be part of the debate, recognise the legitimacy of public concern, recognise the issues that Philip has raised about, about research. So it's been a fascinating conversation. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to, to, to thank Philip for his, his speech and his, his um, answers to your questions. I'm delighted to say that you can join us downstairs for a glass of uh, health-damaging alcohol. Um, uh, there'll be soft drinks as well. Psychologically manipulative. Psych psychologically manipulative alcohol uh, downstairs. Uh, um, thanks to Harris Hagen and Regulus, who are uh, sponsoring this, helping us sponsor this event. So we're very grateful to them. So that's in the room immediately below us just remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking Philip Graff.